Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 207. You can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. And you can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I also want to mention that the free Brain Science mobile app is now called Brain Science Podcast. This app is available for all mobile devices, and it is a great way to access both free and premium content. This month's episode is an encore of an interview with Dr. Luis Pessoa about his book, The Cognitive Emotional Brain, From Interaction to Integration. When we first talked back in 2014, some of the information we discussed was quite surprising. We learned that subcortical brain structures like the amygdala and the thalamus do much more than scientists once assumed. They are both involved in learning and decision making. Another key discovery was that emotion and cognition are deeply entwined at all levels. This has many consequences for how we imagine and understand what our brain does. I'm replaying this conversation now to prepare you for an upcoming episode where Dr. Pessoa and I will discuss his latest book, The Entangled Brain, How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion Are Woven Together. If you would like to get episode show notes automatically every month, just sign up for the free Brain Science newsletter either at brainsciencepodcast.com or by texting Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. When you sign up, you'll get a free gift entitled Five Things You Need to Know About Your Brain. Brain science relies on the financial support of listeners like you. You can learn more at brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash premium. Be sure to keep listening after the interview because I'll review the key ideas and share a few brief announcements. My guest today is Luis Basoa. Luis, I'm really happy to have you on the Brain Science Podcast. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Writers like Antonio Damasio have done a lot to make people aware that our emotions play a vital role in every aspect of our modern lives, including decision-making. But there tends to be a tendency to see emotion and cognition as separate and often opposing functions. Your book, The Cognitive Emotional Brain, argues that because cognition and emotion are so deeply intertwined at every level, it doesn't make any sense to view them as separate. So you take this different approach in your book. So would you give us a brief overview of your book? Uh, sure, I'm happy to do that. That's exactly right. So the approach that I take in the book is is that emotion and cognition are, in a way, the opposite. They're very intertwined. They're always interacting. And in fact, the book tries to discuss many ways in which their signals are integrated. So in that sense, they become sort of emotion cognition signals and the emotion, pure emotion part and the pure cognition part sort of dissolves and becomes something that really, in a in deeper sense, can't really be taken apart. So in one sense, you can view the book as three parts. One is discusses the amygdala, which is a structure that a lot of people have heard about and is viewed as really important for emotional processing. And I try to discuss problems with this typical standard view of amygdala function and propose some alternative frameworks that take into account lots of recent data and a lot of recent thinking about how individual structures might be communicating with lots of other structures in the brain in sort of a network type of perspective. Another part of the book discusses emotional and motivational processing in general. By motivational, I mean things that might be related to reward and competitive, things that people work are willing to put effort and work to attain a goal. And I look at these interactions between emotion, emotional and motivational processing with cognition to, again, illustrate the many levels at which these things are communicating with each other. The last part of the book is a broader perspective on how to understand how can we go about understanding the brain and how this is specific functions that we study in the lab or observe in real life sort of emerge from either individual structures in the brain, which is 
one view that has been prevalent in neuroscience or according to sort of network interactions of many regions, which is my view and also many other people's view of how function emerges from interactions across many brain regions. So that summarizes the three main parts of the book. Yeah, I guess people can't tell when I was um, saying the name of your book, you've got cognitive, emotional with a dash between it to illustrate the idea that the two really are so interconnected as to make separating the words even not make any sense anymore. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, before we get into some of these key ideas, would you tell us just a little bit about yourself and maybe about how you became a neuroscientist? Sure. It's actually maybe similar to other people's experiences. It's quite a torturous, nonlinear sort of trajectory. I grew up in Rio in Brazil, and I was always interested in math and physics and eventually decided to do my bachelor's degree in, in something a little bit more applied. So I went into computer science, but also always interested in the more formal aspects and mathematical aspects of computer science. And then I got involved in projects and also honors thesis-like activities and, and research in artificial intelligence. Gradually, I started becoming more and more interested in, in intelligence in general. What are the biological basis of intelligence? And so one thing led to the other, and eventually I came to the U.S., to Boston, Boston University, to do a PhD in computational neuroscience in a department that had been recently created in 89. I, I arrived in 1990 to do a PhD in computational neuroscience with really a focus on how networks of neurons, either artificial or natural neurons, compute. And so the idea is that we can understand computation from a distributed standpoint, from very simple elements. And so that was my beginning in more computational and away from the empirical. We're interested in the empirical data to understand it. But eventually, after this PhD, I started becoming more and more interested in, in more empirical work. So that's a lot of my work right now is, is more on the empirical and trying to understand it via experiments with humans. Do you by any chance know Miguel Nicolaelis? It's funny because I've never met him, but uh, obviously being a Brazilian and in many conferences or, or kind of circles, we hear of him a lot. No, I haven't met him, but I've seen him give talks and I just haven't had a chance to meet him in person. But he does fascinating work. Yeah, I interviewed him, I guess it's been about three years ago now, when his book came out, which is more aimed at a general audience. And he does a really good job in demonstrating the idea of networking. He has a story in there about a time in Brazil. I guess you had some kind of almost like a dictatorship and the people were sort of protesting and they were all clapping together and how it was the number of people that made it happen. You know, individuals dropped in and out, but it was the mass effect. That's right. Yeah, It was really a great illustration of the idea because one neuron can't do anything, but billions of neurons gives you a human. Yeah, and I extend that exact same concept to brain regions. So one region doesn't do much in my view, but when immersed in, in cooperating, interacting and exchanging signals with many other regions, that's when things really happen. And that's where the human comes from. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about two of the deeper structures in the brain, the amygdala and part of the thalamus called the pulvinar nucleus. These may be unfamiliar structures to many of my listeners. So would you start out just by telling us a little bit about these structures and help us visualize where they are? Sure. So I think to, to understand where the amygdala and the thalamus are in the brain, think of the brain as, as having two parts, sort of like a blanket, an outer part, which is the cortex. This outer blanket cortex is thin, but it actually can be seen as having these layers so it's a set of like really thin blankets that stack on top of each other. So that makes it the outside. And so it has this kind of layered structure. Underneath, there is the, the subcortical part, which is it's much deeper and have these subcortical regions or nuclei. And these are kind of masses of neurons. So they don't have that organization that cortex has. Both the amygdala and the pulvinar, the thalamus, which is a bigger structure, and the pulvinar being a, a smaller part or nucleus of the thalamus, both of these are actually subcortical structures, so sort of deep inside the brain. And the amygdala, as many of your listeners will know, and having read many you know, newspaper type of uh, pieces, that it's, it's traditionally associated with fear processing, automatic threat detection, 
and things of that nature. And, and hopefully we'll get a chance a little bit to talk about how some of my work and the work of many people challenges those notions. And the pulvinar is part of the thalamus, as I said, and the thalamus has been traditionally conceptualized or thought of as sort of a passive relay station in which signals from the periphery, sensory signals, pass through the thalamus on their way to the cortex. And again, we'll be talking about many ways in which this view needs to be updated. And in fact, we'll see that the pulvinar and the thalamus in general is really critical for communication of signals across the brain. And so really this communication and integration of signals really critically depends and involves the thalamus. The amygdala and the thalamus are in the temporal lobe, but they're like in the inside part that's deep and considered subcortical because it doesn't have the layers. Yeah, that's right. So the amygdala is in part of this kind of system called the medial temporal lobe system that has other structures like the hippocampus, which is very important for memory processes and many other things. And the amygdala is a, it's a very small structure, actually. It's funny how some of these small structures can become very famous and have very important roles, in fact, in the brain. But in this case, the name itself reflects the fact that the amygdala is sort of kind of like the shape of an almond and then a little bit the size of a regular almond, in a sense, a little bit bigger, maybe. The pulvinar itself is not in the medial temporal lobe, and the temporal lobe is actually sort of at this kind of central base of the brain where the brain stem, the top of it has this larger structure called the thalamus and the pulvinar is one nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, so the thalamus is that thing that whenever you see the pictures of the brain stem that have the superior colliculi and the pons and all that, it's kind of the thing right up at the top, right? That's exactly right. The thing on the top, yeah, at the top. So one of the key ideas I want listeners to remember is that the amygdala does more than process fear. And I want to also, before we get into that, remind listeners that back in episode 91, Jacques Pangsip talked about the evidence that fear itself actually originates lower in the brain than the level of the amygdala. So just with those pieces of information in mind, can you give us a brief overview of what the current evidence shows that the amygdala actually does? Yeah, I can try to do that. That's very challenging because there are whole books or even series of books dedicated to that with each one with many, many chapters. But I can say a few words about that. Well, I think that listeners should have in mind that to start off, the amygdala is not one thing. So that already poses a huge challenge because in one sense, in a very concrete sense, anatomically, one can subdivide the amygdala in at least, let's say, 12 or even more subparts or nuclei based on their morphology of the neurons, the, you know, the histochemistry, and, and lots of fine properties that allow us to segregate the amygdala in these little parts. But in a very coarse manner, we can think of the amygdala as having basically two parts. One is so-called lateral amygdala, again, more towards the outside of the brain. Again, it's deep inside, but the part that is the lateral amygdala is within the amygdala, but towards the outside. And the central amygdala, again, more central. And it's interesting to think of these two parts because the lateral amygdala and the central amygdala are quite distinct in one sense. So, for instance, the lateral amygdala is quite a bit more cortical-like. It's almost like a, a little piece of cortex in a sense that its organization is a little bit more cortex-like in terms of it doesn't have layers itself, but it's a little bit more organized. And it's also highly connected to cortical regions. So it has broad connectivity with cortical regions. The central amygdala, in contrast, is actually connected to a lot of subcortical regions at the base of the brain. And it's inherently more subcortical-like. One important property of the central amygdala is that it's heavily connected with many structures in the brain stem, literally underneath going down all that trunk, that stem that we can picture when we see pictures of the brain. And those parts of the brain stem are really fundamental for controlling many autonomic functions. So the amygdala, the central amygdala, is sort of like sitting at the top of this and has the ability to engage all these autonomic related structures that really have a direct effect on bodily functions, on how you feel and blood pressure and respiration and all those really emotion related things, for instance. So we can think of the lateral amygdala and the central amygdala, but more broadly, in terms of thinking of the many functions that these two structures and many others in the amygdala are involved in, we can think of a very diverse set of functions, including general arousal, such as controlling the levels of vigilance of an organism, detecting novel stimuli, 
having sort of like surprise related processings when something is unexpected. So the amygdala is really critical for that. And more broadly, in sort of attentional functions, by that I mean, so what is important for the organism? And what deserves further processing? So the amygdala is heavily involved in these attention-like functions. It's also involved in value representation. So what's the value of specific objects outside in the world, both on the negative side, which is the typical story that we hear a lot in, in the news and newspapers and magazines, but also on the positive side. So what's the reward associated with a certain stimulus that I, I have seen in the past, for instance? So because of all these properties of attention and value representation, there's, I think, a growing amount of evidence that the amygdala is involved in simple forms of decision making. Not the super complex decision making that you might think of, I don't know, a mathematician trying to decide how they're going to approve their theorem, but decision making as to what do you approach, what do you avoid, what's the value of things and how that influences your actions. The way that I like to summarize is it's a way that was conceptualized actually in the 70s by Carl Priberman and colleagues. In a sense, the amygdala is involved in determining what is it that is out there. So it's what is it functions. And once you determine what is out there, what are you going to do with them? So what's to be done function? It's not just a simple threat detection engine, but it really is much broader involving understanding what's out there and what the organism should do in the face of those things it's encountering. Okay. I'd like to talk a little bit about how you figure out what the amygdala does. How do we know about these connections? You've told me that the basolateral and the central amygdala have different connections. Is our knowledge of this based on the anatomy in animals or exactly how do we figure this out? That's a really tricky question because for obvious reasons, the bulk of the research is not done with humans. And so we have a lot of the anatomical work done in rats and also done a lot in monkeys. And so careful anatomical work with careful histology and the resolution that we need to understand the connectivity and understand the anatomy is done in these species. Especially the work with monkeys, then the hope is that what we're learning from them really translates to humans. Obviously, there is a step there, and so obviously we're not larger monkeys. But from what we know about the anatomy, a lot is also seen in humans. For instance, when they study actual humans, like post-mortem brains, and there's a little bit of research on actual human anatomy itself. But you're right that there's that indirect aspect that we're inferring from other species and trying to make this connection, which has to be checked and, and understood properly in its own right. But the monkey does provide a good starting point and what's feasible for us to do in trying to understand these systems. And now there's a a lot of growth in, in techniques in humans based on MRI of getting better estimates of anatomy itself. We're not quite there yet, but I think maybe in, in a few years, we'll be able to do a lot more in terms of anatomy itself in humans with magnetic resonance imaging MRI techniques. But as far as functional imaging goes, you can't tell which part of the amygdala is lighting up. If you read some magazine article that says your amygdala lights up when you see a picture of a politician you like or don't like, that doesn't tell you anything about which part of the amygdala is involved, does it? You're right there. But interestingly, we are right at the cusp technologically that we are starting to be able to do that. So we are starting to be able to do higher resolution functional imaging that will be able to distinguish nuclei within the amygdala. So I think there's a little bit of work on that already, and that work needs to be validated and extended. But we're really coming to a time now in which functional MRI is going to be done with regions that are much smaller, basically pixel size, the resolution of the camera, if you will is such that we're going to be starting to be able to separate things like lateral amygdala, central amygdala, and so on and so forth. So we're not far from that, actually. It's an exciting time in that sense. And then the other part that you definitely rarely would be able to do in a person would be direct recordings from the neurons, right? And that seems to be very important in a lot of the studies that you discuss in the book. Again, for obvious reasons, we'll not be doing routinely recordings in humans, but the fascinating aspect that uh, I myself have not been in with, but I've been always interested in, in trying to establish collaborations and, and because it's really incredibly fascinating is being able to do in a limited fashion, but doing direct recordings of patients prior to surgery or in between surgeries. And so there are several groups across the globe that actually have published direct recordings from humans. 
But in the big scheme of things, it's a very small percentage of the overall number of studies. These studies that look at physiology are read either in, in monkeys and more commonly in rats, which I would argue it's quite different, even in terms of there are many differences in the amygdala in rats and monkeys that are really critical, in my opinion. And unfortunately, we still need to figure out how to have more direct measurements in a non-invasive way. So hopefully there are new techniques coming out in the coming years or decades that will allow us to do those kinds of things. One of the experiments, your book, like I said, is full of experiments, and obviously that's one of the time limit constraints that we can't really get into a lot of the details of these experiments. But one that sort of stuck out for me was because it illustrates the idea that the amygdala is doing something more than just communicating emotional information was the experiment that showed that the responses of the amygdala were context-dependent and could even be affected by expectation. Do you remember that example? Yeah, I think I know the experiment that you have in mind. If I'm right, it's an experiment by Dan Salzman and colleagues that was done a few years ago. They were studying how the amygdala codes external events and whether it would be sensitive to both positive and negative information. And, and one of the things that they did was they, they took a little stimulus, let's say, I don't know, a picture of some kind, and associate every time that the monkey saw that picture, they received a, a reward, a little bit of water or, or juice. And with another stimulus, they received something that was aversive. So it was a, a little puff of air to the face. It's not painful, but just mildly uh, aversive. What they found in the amygdala, which was interesting, they found neurons that were actually driven, meaning they responded more strongly, when these cues, the cues to reward came up and when the cues to the punishment came up. But they also responded to the reward itself and to the punishment itself. So the class of neurons that was driven by reward and another one that was driven by the punishment, the aversive stimulus. One interesting thing was actually trying to see what would happen to these neurons if you violated expectations. So for instance, if you have a cue that signals reward, the animal is expecting reward, but if you now emit the puff of air, so it receives the aversive stimulation, so the aversive responding neurons responded as they had before, but actually even more strongly. So showing that the context in which expecting a, a reward but receiving punishment made a, an important difference. And likewise, if the monkey saw the little stimulus that it should anticipate a puff of air, but instead it received a reward, the neurons that were responding to reward responded more vigorously. So it really shows two important things, I believe. One is that the responses are coding both positive and negative events, which is important given the emphasis that people have, the tendency that people emphasize only the negative side of amygdala processing, but also how it's actually highly sensitive to context. My lab and, and many other people have done other experiments showing this context dependency, whether something is relevant to the animal or not relevant, makes a huge difference between the amygdala actually engaging with these stimuli or not. So it's not just a passive responder to negative items, but it really is taking both positive and, and negative and the context in which they appear. What about studying the amygdala in people? I got the impression that for you anyway, this intentional blink paradigm was an important tool, although you mentioned several other paradigms for studying this in humans. Is the intentional blink a good example of how you study this in humans, or would you prefer a different paradigm? No, I think the attentional blink is a really good one because attentional blink essentially refers to, it's actually quite simple. The person sees a series of pictures coming very fast on the screen. So let's say, imagine that I'm showing you pictures outside scenes, you know, a scene of a mountain, a scene of a lake, and, and lots of scenes that you're seeing, but each one is shown very rapidly. So you see, let's say, 10 scenes in per second. So they're just coming by very, very fast, and you're just having this kind of overall visual impression. And you're asked to, within that stream of stimuli, to report after the stream is over, let's say the stream takes two or three seconds. So in that overall stream, you're going to see 20 or 30 stimuli. So after the stream is over, you're asked to report, for instance, if you saw a male or female face within that stream, and if you saw, let's say, a house or a skyscraper type of building or something of that nature. So within a stream, you have to be looking at the stream and trying to detect two targets, a face, let's say, and say if the face is male or female, and an, an outdoor type of building or house. 
This task is not challenging in itself, detecting a face or a house where you're extremely good at it. The tricky part is when the second stimulus, let's say a house, comes very close by in succession to the face itself. So you detect a face, and very soon after that, the house is shown. What happens is this sort of attentional blink, not a physical blink, but attentionally blinking, if you will, so that you don't see the house that follows the face because you were processing your first target, the face, and you sort of miss the second. And so you're not aware. You actually, at the end of the stream, the person asks you, did you see a face? And you say, yes, I saw a male face. And did you see a house? You say, no, in this trial, I didn't see a house. And actually, it was physically shown. So you actually weren't aware of them. So what this really shows is kind of the limited processing capacity of the visual system of the brain in general that once it's engaged on something because it's task relevant, okay, I have to detect this face and I have to later report whether it's male or female, I was engaged in that. But by being engaged in that, I kind of lost track of what was happening and I missed the second stimulus. So it's really an important aspect of these capacity limitations of visual processing. The interesting thing about the attentional blink that has been of interest to lots of us is that if the second stimulus, for instance, a house, is emotional, if it's been linked to some emotional content by its history, it will blink less often. In other words, you actually won't miss it as often. So for instance, in the experiments that we've done in the lab, we pair, let's say, houses with mild electrical stimulation, mild shocks. So you do some kind of classical conditioning to start the experiment, and later you test it in the attentional blink. And what we see is that the houses that have been paired with shock, mild shock, obviously, they're actually detected more reliably, so there's less of a blink. So it's a very important paradigm for lots of different reasons, and including the fact that emotional stimuli survive this attentional blink more strongly. So how does this relate to the amygdala? So the way that it, it relates to the amygdala is that our work and many people's uh, work has shown that when the amygdala is engaged by the emotional stimuli, it actually enhances visual processing, and that enhanced visual processing allows it to sort of survive so that it's not missed. And so if it otherwise didn't have emotional content, it might be missed, but because of its effective significance, it actually survives the blink. So it actually, the amygdala really helps in guiding the brain, the visual system in determining what is of relevance. So it won't get missed out there because we have certain things that we should be paying attention to. And the amygdala helps guide this process together with many other structures, but having an important role in this. Well, I know we've only scratched the surface here, but I hope we've given people sort of an idea of how fascinating this work is and that there's much more to it than they might have imagined. Given the rich interconnections that the amygdala has, both to the higher and the lower regions of the brain, how can we possibly credit it with any particular function of its own? Or should we? Well, I don't think we should. We can't. I mean, that's my view. This is not a universally accepted position, but my view is that it's exactly that. The fact that it's actually so richly interconnected and interacting with so many other structures that we should see its functions as emerging from its interactions with other regions. So in a framework that I describe in the book, I call it the multiple waves model. What the amygdala is doing is really participating in many circuits. And when it's participating with certain circuits, it's actually important for attention. With other circuits, it's important for decision-making, and so on and so forth. So I view the interactions as really the unit of interest, not the region itself, but how it interacts with other regions. So if you were writing the 21st century medical dictionary next to the word amygdala, how would you summarize what it does based on our current knowledge? I think that it's a huge challenge, but I think that it clearly does one thing, which is it has been the classical emphasis, and we should keep that and not throw it away, of course. It's really important in learning about the value of things. It has been traditionally associated with learning negative value. I would extend that to learning about value of things in general, so both negative and positive. But in addition to that learning part, which is classical conditioning and many other kinds of learning types of paradigms, I think there's a long list of functions that we need to be aware of and think of its contributions to processes of arousal and vigilance, novelty detection, attention in general, and simple forms and possibly a little bit more complex forms of decision making so that it really is a larger catalog of functions 
that it's at least participates in so that it's providing important contributions to all of them. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes and talk some about the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus and how it connects to the amygdala and the rest of the brain. So we'll be back in just a minute. Another key chapter in the emotional cognitive brain is the one about effective visual perception. Here you challenge the standard hypothesis that there's a low road that allows visual inputs to go past the cortex. And you do this by demonstrating that the thalamus is more than just a simple relay. I mean, that's what I learned in medical school that the thalamus was. So I'm sure a lot of other people did too. Could you briefly explain the standard hypothesis and then summarize the evidence that led you to propose a different model, your multiple waves model that you mentioned a few minutes ago? Yeah, sure. So I think briefly, I just want to remind the listeners that the low road is this idea that there's a fast, the low road, or in a way we can say the standard hypothesis is the way that I refer to it in the book, is that there's this fast subcortical pathway that essentially can convey threat-related information to the amygdala very fast. So essentially sensory information comes, let's say auditory or visual information comes, and it can reach the amygdala very fast and doesn't have to go via cortex to reach the amygdala according to this hypothesis. And that's important because the idea is that this property of being subcortical is important because this processing would be able to take place in a fashion that is independent of attention. So whether I'm paying attention to a certain sound or not, or a visual stimulus or not, it's processed and very fast, and it's independent of awareness. So I might not even be aware of something, and it's actually going to have an effect because it's actually going to stimulate, engage the amygdala. And it's not just a theoretical interest, but the fact that many of these processes might be altered and modified in psychopathology of anxiety disorders and things of that nature. So the idea is this fast pathway is really important. It has guided thinking in the field quite a bit. The types of problems with this notion that I discuss in the book is that the emphasis has been on processing that is very fast and sort of independent of attention. So I review evidence showing that in comparison to this kind of subcortical processing, cortical processing is also extremely fast. So it, The notion that everything that happens in cortex is laborious and slow and very detailed, that's just not correct. There are very fast signals being communicated and transmitted in cortex. And I also challenge, based on my own work and many people's work, this notion that signals that reach the amygdala are strongly, I challenge the idea that they are strongly independent of attention and awareness. I have many experiments have shown that attention is really critical to the signals that you have in the amygdala. So whether something you're paying attention to something or not makes a difference on the extent to which these signals are registered in the amygdala. So it's not just reaching the amygdala almost like in this obligatory fashion, regardless of you willing or being attending to something. And another important piece of information is that many of these effects in which processing of emotional information is enhanced actually can be observed even in now human patients that do not have amygdala. They have, let's say, bilateral amygdala lesions. And these effects of emotional stimuli are not abolished, suggesting that the amygdala is not the only player that is capable of enhancing processing given effective significance. So with these properties and also careful consideration about the underlying anatomy, I have sort of advocated that we should Think of processing not in terms of this fast, simple subcortical pathway, but in terms of many circuits or many processing waves of information that actually convey the effective and biological significance of the information out there in the world. Okay, that's a good introduction. One of the key pieces of your argument is the fascinating research about the pulvinar nucleus. It's time for you to tell us a little bit about this and why it's so important. Yeah, the pulvinar is really fascinating. It's part of the thalamus. In one respect, we can think of it as, okay, it's sort of a boring part of the brain because it's basically just a relay station. Things are far in the brain, so they stop in the thalamus and then they're transmitted to the brain. They're passed on to the brain. But the anatomy of the pulvinar is so fascinating. It really is such that it's so intricately and richly interconnected with the brain that it really suggests, and now with many kinds of evidence 
adding to the anatomical evidence, that is not just the thalamus itself, but especially the pulvinar. It's not really just simply a passive relay station, but it's really critical for integrating signals and, in fact, guiding how cortical regions are communicating with each other. One of our studies that showed that it's not just a simple passive relay station showed that the pulvinar responds only to stimuli that are consciously perceived. So when the stimulus was of biological significance because it had been paired with mild shock in the past and the stimulus was detected, the pulmonar was engaged and I believe was part of amplifying the signals related to the stimulus. But when it was not perceived by a person because it was presented very fast and the person actually missed it, so it was physically shown to them, but they missed it. In those trials in which the stimuli were missed, the pulvinar was not engaged. So it really shows that I think the pulvinar is really involved in amplifying signals that are related to the information that is relevant to the organism, which is essentially another way of saying that the pulvinar is really critical for attention. We pay attention to the things that are of relevance. And it has all these bi-directional connections, especially to the cortex. I think you quoted somebody else as describing the I don't remember if it was the pulvinar or the entire thalamus as having the cortex shrink-wrapped over it. Yeah, it's the pulvinar. It's as if almost the entire cortex projects to the pulvinar. It's an amazing property, and I think it's very poorly understood how that is actually influencing and maybe even directing cortical communication, which is an idea that several people have been starting to advocate. And it's an integral piece of understanding how signals are communicating in cortex itself. I also thought it was really interesting the fact that the pulvinar fires for things that are consciously perceived, not for things that are missed. That sort of goes against this claim, you know, we're in the in one of these fads where they're saying everything is unconscious and there's this idea, you know, that our emotions are unconscious forces. This kind of goes against that, doesn't it? Yeah, I do think so. I, I think there's a, a lot to be said. These circuits really are not passive. It's sort of the opposite of this traditional view that everything is passively going by and almost like hopeless automata that are out there and just being bombarded by stimuli and we're just not aware of them. I'm not saying that everything is processed to the same level, but structures like the pulvinar and and many other structures in the brain, the superior colliculus, the amygdala, and and many parts of cortex are really narrowing in, zooming in into the things that are of critical importance and highlighting those. And they often rise to the level that we are aware of them. And and so I think that there's a greater importance to that kind of processing that people actually traditionally attribute to them there. The fact that the connections are two-way is really important to it. That's one of the things that goes against the old relay viewpoint. If it was just a relay, we wouldn't need signals back from the cortex, would we? That's exactly right. The interconnectivity is both ways and very dense in both ways, yeah. Once we know now what the pulvinar is doing, does that have any impact on our view of the thalamus in general? Yes, I think, again, the idea that really the thalamus cannot be understood anymore in terms of these passive relays. It's actually, it really is something that we need to understand in terms of um, this kind of a central hub of communication that is really affecting overall signals in the entire brain, both subcortical and cortical. So cortical communication is not just pure cortical communication. It's communication that also involves the thalamus. So I think that's one critical architectural feature that is really fundamental for us to understand how signals are being communicated in the brain. Has anybody studied the other parts of the thalamus? Do you think similar principles will apply to other parts of the thalamus once it's studied? Yeah, so I think that there's a distinction. I'm not an expert on the thalamus more generally, but one distinction that is made is that the pulvinar is considered, and several other nuclei in the thalamus are considered sort of second-order nuclei as opposed to more first-order, more relay types. There is some truth to the fact that some nuclei in the thalamus are closer to being more of a passive station and region. And others are much more involved in these large circuits involving cortex. But in general, I do think that the emphasis is actually on both cortical thalamus communication and and we shouldn't view even parts of the thalamus as pure, just simple relay stations. I, I don't believe in that notion. I think that there's a lot more interactivity than we tend to assume. So then, how does this knowledge change our view of what the amygdala is doing in visual processing? 
Well, I think that the amygdala story is a little bit different, right? So, I mean, the amygdala, um, for instance, the amygdala's role in visual processing, to a large extent, has to do with its own anatomy and projections. The anatomy of the amygdala is such that it receives signals from visual cortex, from parts of the visual cortex that have very elaborate response properties that might respond to faces and objects and complex properties, visual properties. But the amygdala itself, once it receives those signals, it's able to, within its own circuit, to process them and assess their biological significance, their effective emotional significance. And the amygdala has projections to all levels of the visual cortex itself. So it's actually then able to affect, to influence visual processing at many levels. So not only the levels that have complex response properties from which it receives signals, but also in so-called early visual cortex, primary visual cortex, visual area V2, V4, and so on, which have simpler response properties. So the bottom line is that by being able to influence visual processing at all these stages, it really determines what we should see out there. So it's actually this kind of important highlighter. It's saying, you know, look there, look here. It's really guiding this visual system in determining what gets to be seen in this barrage of stimulation that we always have. So it's really picking out the important information, the significant from what is not as significant and helping guide vision and visual processing. But this isn't just because it has the subcortical connections that are the part of the traditional model, but because it has all these extensive connections to many parts of the brain, including all parts of the visual cortex, right? That's right. So it's not because it's receiving something in a privileged fashion in a subcortical pathway, but it's receiving all sorts of signals from visual cortex and, in fact, across the brain, integrating them. And based on context and relevance and goals and all these factors together, then it's actually in a position anatomically to influence a lot of things, including visual cortex. That's exactly right. So it seems clear that both the amygdala and the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus do a lot more than I was taught in medical school. And it also appears that affective and cognitive processes are deeply intertwined. One question that still sticks out for me is, what is the key difference between the role of the pulvinar and the role of the amygdala? Because they do some similar things, but how are they different? Yeah, there's one key difference. So again, there are many similarities because I think that they're important in influencing the flow of information very broadly. So they are very broadly connected. So they function in these really strongly connected hubs and they have an ability to influence processing. So in one sense, the pulvinar fits very neatly into that. It's very widely connected. In fact, much more widely connected than the amygdala in a sense. As you mentioned just a little while ago about this remarkable connectivity with almost all of cortex. So in one sense, the pulvinar is very associational. It's actually integrating, integrating signals and associating signals and transmitting signals. The amygdala definitely has some of these properties too. But here comes the critical distinction. The amygdala is very heavily connected also to these very deep subcortical structures in the brainstem that are essential for autonomic functioning. So, for instance, it has very strong connectivity with the hypothalamus and controlling all of these autonomic functions that keep us alive and make us feel things and change things like respiration, blood pressure, and all these properties that are very bodily in essence. So the amygdala is more finely tuned, if you will, in its connectivity to cortical regions and has many connections to other cortical regions that are important for it. Did you mean to say the pulvinar? No, actually, I mean the amygdala. So the amygdala has connectivity to both cortical and subcortical regions. The subcortical regions via the central nucleus of the amygdala to this brainstem autonomic centers, if you will, via the lateral amygdala to cortical regions, but a lot of the connectivity to cortical regions, it's more limited and focused and guided than the pulvinar, which is very broad. And many of the connections that the amygdala has cortically are to regions, cortical regions, that are important for stimulus evaluation. So what's the significance of a stimulus? So regions like the orbital frontal cortex, regions like the insula, regions like the medial prefrontal cortex, and other regions that are very important in these more evaluative functions. So the amygdala has this bodily component and this more value angle to it, and the pulvinar has a broader sort of communication that is helping the association of signals and is also important for valuation, for significance, but it's sort of broader. 
Yeah, that's why you use the word integration in your book when describing the function of the pulvinar. I think that's a good way of saying it. It's really important for this broad integration of signals, and the amygdala has that, but it's through a kind of a, an angle or a lens that is more value-based. And it has, obviously, the bodily part, too, which is really critical and changes everything, right? Because, you know, the hypothalamus is controlling everything that is important for being alive, and the amygdala is communicating you know, the hypothalamus and many other structures, obviously, throughout the brainstem, and the amygdala is right there talking to them. So it will feel very different, right, when we get a jolt and emotion. You feel it in your body, obviously, and that's one thing that we always say, you know, that's what emotion is about, right? We can't leave out the prefrontal cortex. We've traditionally been told that the cognitive processing of emotional information occurs in the prefrontal cortex, but your work seems to argue that the emotion and cognition are deeply intertwined long before they reach the prefrontal cortex because they're entwined in the amygdala and the thalamus. So what does your approach tell us about the prefrontal cortex? Yeah, I think that the prefrontal cortex is definitely, again, because it receives these signals from many places, including pulvinar and the amygdala and, and many other places, and integrates many. I mean, the, the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that people would associate with the greatest amount of signal integration. So by that itself, it has the ability to receive signals that have these emotion and cognitive sides to them. So it, it really is such that by its integration of signals and its anatomy, such that emotion and cognition are heavily intertwined. And so I view this property of communication and integration and inter interaction throughout the brain. And, and the anatomy of the prefrontal cortex is certainly one that is heavily able and tuned to exactly that kind of integration of signals. So there's no such thing as a purely cold rat signal and a purely emotional signal. Those things are emerging all the time and the frontal cortex is receiving all those influences. So whatever people would label as cognitive is happening immersed in a context that is motivational and emotional at all times. Yeah, one of my guests that I've actually had on the show a couple of times is a retired neurologist, Robert Burton, and he has said that the idea that we could have autonomous, rational thought just doesn't fit how our brains really work. I agree with that completely. So even if, for instance, the part of the brain that is viewed as the most cognitive, if you will, the lateral prefrontal cortex, you know, people will invoke certain properties like, oh, the amygdala doesn't have heavy connectivity with the lateral prefrontal cortex. So therefore, the lateral prefrontal cortex is pure cognition or the purest form of cognition. Even if it's true that the connectivity is not very strong with lateral prefrontal cortex, it only takes one extra synapse to reach from the amygdala to lateral prefrontal cortex. So the signals can go from the insula to lateral prefrontal cortex. You know, amygdala, insula, lateral prefrontal cortex, or amygdala, medial prefrontal cortex, lateral prefrontal cortex. I think sometimes people make the mistake that the communication has to be direct. So if there's no connection between A and B, then A is not influencing B. We know that the architecture is such that this is a network, and so it reaches B via some other node, and what really matters is the ability that these signals have of reaching them. Obviously, a direct, strong connection is very important. That's not to deny that importance, but the importance of these indirect connections is really key. So there's no little place in the brain that is hiding, and it's able to do pure cognition. Right. So is there anything else that you would like to share before we close? Well, I think one thing that I would like to suggest that I really like myself, and I try to, to always remind people in my own lab and people I interact with, is that I think humans have a great desire to simplify things. I think we love simplicity, but I don't know. I love complexity. I think we need to embrace the complexity of the whole thing, and we need to stop studying the brain one region at a time, and we need to understand how these regions are talking to each other, and, and this talking is where the action happens. And again, let go a little bit of the impulse that we have to understand things in this kind of almost linear, simple sense, and be happy with complex systems and embrace complexity, if you will. If it's really true that the human brain is the most complex system known to man, 
then if we really want to understand it, we don't have any choice, do we? Exactly. So I think we need to to be bolder and to not stick to the simple stories. You know, they're easy to communicate, they're easy to grasp, they're easy to make connections, but they're just too simple. I think that we really need more complexity because what we're studying is highly complex. Absolutely. So what about advice for students? There's quite a few students that listen to this show. Yeah, so... I mean, obviously, my advice is through my own biases and the way that I ended up in this field. And so I think that, you know, if you want to study the mind, let's say via psychology, or it's wonderful, obviously, and or you, you're more biologically inclined, so you want to study the brain via biology. It is great, but I would say don't forget to study and focus on what we call understanding data. So data science is something that people are starting to talk about now. And, but it's just really some combination of having some familiarity with mathematical concepts and being comfortable with computer science and programming and definitely being comfortable and learning statistics because what we really need to do is make sense of very complex data now. And so we're talking about all these regions talking to each other and communicating and all these complex data that are acquired behaviorally, longitudinally, and multiple times you study MRI with multiple modalities and anatomical aspects, functional aspects, and other types of imaging modalities. So we need to put all these things together. So I think that we need, you know, for instance, in the mind and the brain, we need the tools for that. And so it's a little bit like physics, you know, they were interested in the universe and in natural science, but they have to uh, approach it via um, tools that are formal in nature. And I think that the mind and the brain also need those kinds of tools. So I definitely would encourage students to don't give up on the math and the computer science and the stats and learn that because it, it really pays off. Yeah. And I think we really need more skills skilled people in this field so that we can be generating good data and not bad data. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So is there an unanswered question that's currently driving your work? Oh, oh, yeah. One thing that I'm always interested in is how things are interacting with each other. And so right now, one of the things that we were working on in the lab is understanding a little bit like I hinted at it during this conversation is understanding interactions between aversive and appetitive systems. So systems that people have traditionally conceptualized as separate things that are related to reward processing and how I approach information, appetitive systems, aversive systems, things related to fear and threat and the negative part of the spectrum and how many regions in the brain are actually doing both and understanding how they interact with each other and eventually their impact on behavior via altering perception and cognition by influencing how we perceive the world and how we think about things. And that really goes on with your everything's intertwined view of the world because now we've also not only have the emotions intertwined with cognition, but the positive and the negative are hard to separate too. Yeah, that's my angle. I like to complicate things. Yeah, well, that's real life for you. Luis, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. And I really enjoyed your book. I don't think it's a great book for the general reader, but this book is really aimed at scientists and students, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I didn't write it as a general audience type of book. I think in the future, I'll be interested in trying to convey these ideas in a way that is more attractive and broader. Yeah. I'd encourage you to read Miguel's book as a nice role model of an excellent book of that sort. Actually, I put his and Eric Kendall, their books together, although his wasn't as much of a biography as Kendall's, but there's a lot of similarity in the things that make both those books work. Because I'm getting ready to interview Dr. Pessoa again, I went through our first conversation more carefully than I usually do, and I've decided to include my original episode summary. I will warn you that it is fairly detailed, but given the density of this episode, I think you will find the repetition helpful. You may also want to return to this summary for review before you listen to our next conversation. I will try to keep my announcements short today, but I have to remind you that you will find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. Since this is an encore episode, the transcript will be free, and I hope you will find it useful. You can also send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I know you don't want to miss the upcoming follow-up interview, so please be sure to sign up for the free Brain Science newsletter so that you can get show notes automatically each month. Just text 
brain science, all one word, to 55444. That's brain science, all one word, to 55444. And of course, you'll get your free gift, the handout, five things you need to know about your brain. I want to thank everyone who supports my work, either financially or by sharing it with others. I have created a table to help you decide whether my Lipson or Patreon is best for you. Patreon supporters who pledge at least $10 per month get transcripts, ad-free episodes, and a copy of my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. If you're already a $10 supporter but didn't get your copy, be sure to let me know. I want to thank Luis Pessoa for talking with me about his book, The Cognitive Emotional Brain, From Interactions to Integration. I think he did a good job of introducing us to a fascinating new way to look at the interaction between cognition and emotion. As I mentioned, this book is for students and working scientists, but I think the key ideas are relevant to everyone. It's important to realize that the old way of seeing emotion and cognition as separate and sometimes opposing processes is becoming obsolete. Before I start my review, I want to remind you that detailed show notes and complete episode transcripts are available at brainsciencepodcast.com. In the show notes, I will also include links to all the previous episodes that relate to today's conversation. So in our conversation with Dr. Pessoa, we were focusing mainly on two parts of the brain that you may or may not have heard of before called the amygdala and the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus. The amygdala is in the medial temporal lobe near the hippocampus which means if you think about pointing in from your ears, it's kind of in the middle there. The thalamus is at the very top of the brainstem, and the pulvinar is its largest nucleus. As Dr. Pessoa explained, you could divide the amygdala up into as many as 12 parts, but he talked about two main parts, the lateral amygdala, which is almost cortex-like and is highly connected to the cortical regions of the brain, and the central or more medial amygdala, which is more primitive and connects to the brain stem, which controls autonomic functions like breathing and blood pressure. You've probably heard of the amygdala because of its connection to fear and other negative stimuli. But what we talked about today is that the amygdala is about more than fear. It's involved in arousal and vigilance, which you would consider these attentional functions, and also value representation, which means that it is involved in simple decision making. The key idea here is that cognition begins before you get to the cortex, and emotion and cognition can't be separated in terms of where they occur in the brain. We talked about how the evidence for these conclusions is mostly based on the work with animals. But Dr. Pessoa did tell us that the resolution for functional MRI is approaching that needed to be able to tell what parts of the amygdala are being stimulated or firing. Now, a lot of the single cell recordings taken from the amygdala are done in animals like mice and monkeys. The visual system has been extensively studied in monkeys because it's assumed to be similar to that of humans. And one reason why there's an emphasis on visual processing in this book is that this is the system that we understand because it's been studied the most. Another key idea is the fact that the amygdala does respond to both positive and negative stimuli, returning to my key idea that it's not just about fear. Now, in trying to study what's going on in the amygdala in people, various paradigms are used. And one we touched on during the conversation was something called attentional blink, which refers to the fact that when you see a visual stimulus, there's a brief period where your brain's processing that stimulus. And if something else appears, you might miss it. And so that's like a blink. This period of time is about 200 to 500 milliseconds. And it turns out that if the second stimulus has emotional 
relevance, this effect is diminished. That is, you're more likely to see the second object. It's interesting to realize that the responses of the amygdala track perceptual responses. That means that the amygdala is influencing what we see and what we pay attention to. But it's also important to realize that the amygdala is not acting alone, but rather it is an important part of what you might think of as the brain's attentional network. After we talked about the amygdala, we talked about the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus. A nucleus is just a cluster of neurons. The thalamus is located, like I said a minute ago, at the very top of the brain stem, that is at the base of the brain proper. It has long been thought to be the major relay station between the brain and the body, but Dr. Pessoa and his colleagues are challenging this view. He is also specifically challenging what he calls the standard hypothesis, which is that there's a so-called low road by which sensory information goes rapidly from the periphery through the thalamus straight to the amygdala, the assumption being that this is faster and also essentially unconscious. The challenge to this is based on research that goes against all these basic elements. First, there's evidence that the amygdala is more involved in attention and awareness than we thought. Second, as Dr. Pessoa mentioned, it has been shown that the pathways involving the cortex are faster than was originally assumed, so that we don't need this low pathway from a speed standpoint. Finally, the anatomy just doesn't support the idea that the thalamus is a mere relay station because it has extensive connections to many parts of the cortex, including the various sensory areas and the frontal lobes, and these connections are in both directions. Pessoa's multiple waves model reflects this by having information come to the amygdala, not just from the thalamus, but also from various parts of the cortex. The reason we focused on the pulvinar is that it's the largest nucleus and it processes visual information. And as I said, vision is the most well studied. So what is the function of the pulvinar if it's not a relay station? First, remember that Dr. Pessoa told us that it responds only to stimuli that are consciously perceived. He said that it helps amplify signals that are important or relevant to the organism. The fact that it has extensive connections to virtually the entire cortex is particularly relevant to this function. He also said that instead of thinking of the pulvinar and the rest of the thalamus by implication as a passive relay, we should think of it as what he called a central hub of communication because it connects to both the cortex and the brainstem. Returning to the amygdala for a few moments. In terms of its role in visual processing, the key idea to remember is that it has extensive connections in both directions to all the various visual areas in the brain, ranging from the primary visual cortex to the association areas. So it has a key role in determining what we see and what we pay attention to. Which brings me back to the most important idea of this episode – which is that the emotional and cognitive processes of the brain are deeply intertwined at every level. That's why this book is called The Cognitive Emotional Brain. As always, we could only hit on the highlights of this fascinating topic. We didn't have time to talk much about what happens in the prefrontal cortex, but here the evidence is also mounting that cognitive and emotional processes are not segregated as has long been assumed. Another aspect of the book that we almost totally ignored was the importance of network theory. For that, I have to refer you back to my previous interviews with Olaf Sporns. I do want to point out that Pessoa and Sporns both share the opinion that network theory is essential for understanding the complex functions of our brain because no one section of the brain can carry out its function in isolation. So I hope you'll come away from this episode realizing that there's more to the amygdala and the thalamus than you might have ima ever imagined and that cognition and emotion are deeply intertwined at every level. Music 
I hope you enjoyed this encore episode with Luis Pessoa. Stay tuned for an upcoming episode about his new book, The Entangled Brain, How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion Are Woven Together. This book is aimed at listeners of all backgrounds. One of the things it does is explain why we should abandon the idea of the so-called limbic system. You can find more episodes and sign up for the Brain Science newsletter at brainsciencepodcast.com. Please send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I also want to mention that the Brain Science mobile app is now called Brain Science Podcast. It is available for all mobile devices and is a great way to access both free and premium content. Finally, don't forget that I'm moving to New Zealand and I would love to hear from listeners in Australia and New Zealand. Of course, I want to hear from you wherever you live. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Brain Science is copyrighted to Virginia Campbell, MD. You may copy this episode to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mindfire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.